Suspense. Tonight's Suspense brings you as star Mr. Henry Morgan. Each week you hear Mr. Morgan as prime comedian on his own radio show. Tonight he appears in a role different from any he's ever played before. But first, we'd like to remind you that... Wherever entertaining is the last word in gracious hospitality, the first name in wines is... C-R-E-S-T-A? B-L-A-N-C-A? Cresta? Blanca. Cresta Blanca. That's Cresta Blanca wines. And for the knowing tongue, Cresta Blanca has created two rare California sherries. Dry Watch, a delightfully pale dry sherry that's the perfect prelude to dining. And Triple Cream, the magnificently mellow sherry that won the gold medal at the California State Fair. Yes, when you pour Cresta Blanca, Dry Watch, and Triple Cream, you and your guests enjoy the best. Shenley's Cresta Blanca Wine Company, Livermore, California. And now, Shenley brings you radio's outstanding theater of thrills... Suspense! Presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A. Roma Wines of Fresno, California. And starring Henry Morgan in Dream Song. A suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Shenley by William Spear. The apartment was one and a half rooms, about enough space to turn around, sleep, and eat in. But it was enough for a bachelor like me, and I felt lucky. I'd had to move out of my last place in sort of a hurry. You know how you get pushed around nowadays. And I had no real right expecting anything even halfway decent to turn up for me so soon. I went about installing myself, which merely means bringing in my old studio couch, an old chair, about three trillion books, a couple of Matisse prints, and my typewriter... And I was all set in a day or two and ready to get down to real work on the book. One evening, I came in after a good dinner and sat down to finish off a sequence. It wasn't writing easy. I felt that I was getting off on a tangent. I was going a million miles away from what I wanted to say, and it annoyed me. It was then that I... Heard it for the first time. It was coming from the next apartment, and coupled with my bad writing, it was very annoying. I tried to ignore it, but that couldn't be done. I got up and walked around the room a few times. That didn't help any. So I sat down and tried to write again. But I was tough, and the right words came like water from a closed faucet, and then the music stopped. And it was suddenly very peaceful. I felt my mind settle down. I started once more. There, it was going along pretty well now. I was thinking clearly. The phrases were right. The mood was good. The dialogue. And the thing started up again. I yanked the paper out of the machine and tossed it into the wastebasket. I was through for the night. A few nights later, after spending the entire day reading, which is so much more delightful than writing, I decided it was about time to sit down and start pounding it out. It was a beautiful night. It took a lot of willpower to tear myself away from the window. I smoked a couple of cigarettes and decided I'd start work after them. Then smoked a few more and listened to the night noises of the city. After that, I searched my pockets for some more cigarettes, but I didn't have any. So I took a deep breath reluctantly turned my back on the city and sat down at my work table. There was a story in the paper that I wanted to keep because it was sort of like the situation I was writing about, and I was cutting it out. Then, almost as though it was timed, that canned music started up. Well, that settled my work for the night again, I thought. That fool in the next apartment, whoever he or she might be, was probably planning to serenade himself for hours on end. And yet, strangely enough, I half hoped that the music would go on. It was a very lovely evening, and I was looking for the slightest excuse to lounge around. I just started thinking of going for a walk when the music stopped. In the stillness that followed, I could hear steps. And then a door opening and closing, and then a long, long silence. Silence. 
Then I was back at my typewriter, and everything was fine. The words were coming right from my brain to my fingers. And as I wrote, I could see the next line and the next. And then, while I was working, I became conscious of the next door footsteps, and it disturbed me. I sat up, stretched, yawned, looked at my watch. One o'clock in the morning. I hadn't realized it was that late. Yes? Who is it? It's me, Mr. Kenyon, the janitor. Uh, please open the door. What's oh, wrong? Well, you always come around at one in the morning. Excuse it, please, Mr. Kenyon. Are you I... Charles Kenyon? Of course. What is it? He's from the police station, Mr. Kenyon. Here you are. I'm Sam Fields from this precinct. Can I come in? Come right in. What's this all about? Apartment 4D, Mr. Rodson. Why don't been... you shut up? Uh, Kenyon, you've been home all night? Yes, I have. What have you been doing here all night? Mr. Kenyon's a Look, writer. Look, are you going to keep your trap shut? Go ahead, Kenyon. Well, I'm a writer, and I've been working all evening. That's about all. You didn't hear no noise, no commotion? No. What's happened? The man in the apartment 4D's been killed, <clears throat> murdered. Oh, the floor is all what? covered with blood. Oh, we'll never get it off without scraping. That'll run up a bill, too. 4D. That's two flights up? Oh, he was a pretty good guy, that Mr. Rodson. He gave me five for We're Christmas. We're just in here checking up. I don't suppose you knew him. No, I didn't. Well, he must have been killed a short time ago. The coroner's upstairs now. The janitor here heard a struggle and phoned in. Yeah, I live in 4E now. The owner chopped the basement up into three apartments. Well, he makes a barrel of money that way, this you Mr. see. Mr. Rodson was I, just about dead when we got there. I'm surprised you didn't hear us go up. I was uh, busy writing. Yeah, it must have been. Oh, all that blood on the floor. We, we'll never get it off. By the next tenant, we'll have to paint the floor red, I tell you. Uh, how was he killed? He was stabbed in the back with a sharp instrument. Yeah, some yeah, kind. He stabbed in Not the back. a knife, the doc says. It could be maybe a shears or scissors. Well, we looked all around, but you couldn't find no scissors. The murderer isn't giving our souvenirs this week. Well, Mr. Kenyon, I guess you're okay. We may want you to come down to headquarters for a few questions tomorrow. If so, I'll let you know. Yes, of course. You can go back to your writing now. Hey, what do you write? Detective stories? No, about, uh, about people. Yeah? <laughs> That's who commits the murders, too, people. Although I must say some of my best friends are people. What'd you write tonight? I don't see nothing around. I, uh, I don't like to have people see it, you know, until it's finished. You know, I got a tenant already for that apartment. Maybe that's why the guy was knocked off, so someone could get the apartment. Uh, what about his wife? Oh, four D's got no wife. Now, I know he has got a young lady, but he is a bachelor. All right, all right, all right. We ain't uh, interested uh, in gossip. Come on, let's go. Oh, I'll hi. be seeing you, Mr. Kenyon. Yes. Uh, good night. One night, a week after that, I was lying in bed trying to sleep. I don't know why I couldn't sleep. I've been working hard all day. I was dead tired. My legs felt heavy, but my brain, instead of feeling dull, was sharp and alert. Quite suddenly, and for no reason, I felt waves of chills run along my spine. I sat up in bed, reached for a cigarette. I looked at my watch. 2.20, and I'd wanted to get up at 7. I snuffed out the butt and leaned back. Somehow, I seemed a bit more relaxed now. I closed my eyes and felt comfortable, tired out. And then there it was again, that music. And I was wide awake again and tense and jumpy as a cat. I don't know why it made me feel that way, but it did. It went on and on. Sometimes it would seem to be fading away. Then it would be loud again. And then fade away. I crouched beneath the covers and drew the pillow over my head. That was better. I could still hear it, but it wasn't so bad. And it seemed to get farther and farther and farther away. And I was so tired. Exhausted by now. I heard that sort of thump from somewhere upstairs. But it didn't matter now. All I cared about was sleep. Sleep. Just sleep. Uh, oh, oh, what was Are you that? All right? uh, of course I'm all right. Just a minute, I'm still in bed. 
Can a man sleep around here oh, without people? I didn't know you were sleeping. You always sleep this late, Ken. Oh, Inspector, I didn't recognize you. I guess I'm still a little bleary. I... Come on in. I ask if you always sleep this late. Twelve? Guess it is late. No, I don't usually, but I couldn't get to sleep last night. Uh, last night? Shut was... up. Kenyon, do you know the guy who lives upstairs? That was Mr. Blackwell, the lawyer. I'm sorry, I don't. I don't know anyone around here. I do my work, that's all I know. Look, you asked me these questions the last time you were here. Yeah, 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 I know, and I'm asking them again. Mr. Blackwell, he's been killed. Killed? Upstairs? Yep, killed the same way. Floor just filled with blood, just like 4D. Well, last night I did hear something. Hmm? I didn't think it was anything then. It was just a sound, like a table or something falling over from upstairs. There was no table falling. What time do you think you heard it? A little while after I went to bed. A little after 2 a.m. Mr. Blackwell divorced his wife five months ago. She was such a nice woman. The coroner says death took place around that time. You didn't hear anything else, did you? What? I said, did you hear anything else? Anything else? Anything else? That music. But I couldn't tell him about that. I couldn't tell it to a detective. Or that terrible feeling I had when I heard it would sound silly, crazy. I yes, could... yes. Did you hear anything else? No. No, I didn't hear anything else. I went to sleep right after that, and I didn't wake up until you rang the bell just Mr. now. Mr. Blackwell gave me a ten for Christmas, but he never smiled. He was a very We've sad man. We've been checking up to see if everyone else is all right. Has anyone else? No, 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 no. Just this guy above you. I, I guess we got some sort of maniac operating in this area. Well, he tries to get me. He's going to get a big surprise. I got a license to carry a gun. I got a good gun, too. My son brought it to me from Germany. <laughs> well, now, don't go shooting the tenants just because they don't pay the rent. <laughs> Everybody pays the rent here. Oh, did you ever see a guy with no sense of humor? Well, this whole thing doesn't seem particularly funny. <laughs> well, don't you worry about it, Mr. Kenyon. You've got the whole police force protecting you, so don't worry yeah. about it at all. Well, I'll probably be seeing you. Yeah. So long. So long. Uh, good, uh, goodbye, Mr. Kenyon. Oh, uh, Mr. Torsten, yeah. will you stay a moment? I'd like you to do something for me. Why, uh, sure, sure. Mr. Torsten, you seem to know a good deal about everyone in the building. I don't you? snoop around. Oh, I'm the janitor. I, I, I just see them I and know. other people I'm, don't see I them. I know. I, I didn't mean it that way. I just want to ask you a question or two. Uh, this Mr. Blackwell who was killed, he was living alone, wasn't he? Yeah, and like I told you, he was married, but the, his wife moved out. Do you know it's harder to take blood off the floor than it is from the walls? You can paint the walls, but the floor has to be scraped uh, and sanded. Uh, what about my uh, my neighbor to the left, next door? Oh, uh, 2E? Well, I don't know too much about him. I just seen him once. He never bothers me. His name is Williams. Has he uh, got a phonograph? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Got lots of records for the phonograph, too. I seen them when they put the telephone in. That was the only time I was ever in his place. I see. Well, uh, thanks a lot, Mr. Torsten. Oh, that's a... Well, say, thank you, Mr. Kenyon. And if there's ever any time you ever want anything, don't be afraid to ask. No, I... I won't be afraid. No, I... I won't be afraid. For Suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you Henry Morgan in Dream Song. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. This is the season when the air is clear and sharp, the kind of weather to whet appetites to razor keenness. Well, here's an easy, inexpensive way to make the plainest food taste like a chef's masterpiece. For family meals or when guests come to dinner, just serve a delicious Roma California table wine, such as robust Roma Burgundy or delicate pale gold Roma Sauterne. You'll be amazed how much these delicious Roma wines and to your mealtime enjoyment. Now, the simplest, most economical meals take on new glamour and flavor goodness. Remember, there's a better tasting Roma wine for every occasion, for every taste. Yet it costs little to enjoy this taste luxury. So always serve Roma wines, 
That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's favorite wines. And now Roma Wines bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Henry Morgan, starring as Charles Kenyon, with Wally Mayer as the inspector and Joseph Kearns as Torsten in Dream Song, a play well calculated to keep you in suspense. first time in my life, I felt genuinely afraid. Because it was something you couldn't know, couldn't fight. An innocent knock on the door, you open it, the next thing that happens is you're found in a pool of blood. With that intolerable canned music coming from next door. I wondered what that Williams looked like, living next door. Why should he play that one record over and over again when he had so many? Torsten said that. And I wondered what he sounded like. The house phone. Uh, give me Mr. Williams' apartment, 2E. The music started. That meant he was in, and I could find out what it sounds like. There's no answer. Shall I keep ringing, sir? Why doesn't he answer? He's there. Maybe he knows I'm calling. Maybe he can hear me call. Shall I keep ringing, sir? Well, why doesn't he... Oh, uh, no. Never mind, operator, never mind. I was certain that Williams had heard me call him on the phone. Had been, as a matter of fact, waiting for me to call. From that day on, I left peace of mind behind. I thought of moving, but there was no place to go. I smoked more and more. I sat for hours in a dark movie in the park in the public library reading room. And still that record revolved in my ears. If only I could get to know who this Williams was. If I could get to see him. If I could get to observe him somehow without his observing me. I was in the park when I thought of it. I could see our windows from the park. I hurried home. I searched in a drawer for my one war souvenir, my German liberated binoculars. Powerful 8 by 50 Zeiss field glasses. There they were, still dusty. I wiped them with my shirt, went back downstairs to survey the terrain. I hurried over to the park, my heart beating like a trip hammer. Leaned against the body of an old auto, trying to look at ease. I looked up at William's window. The Venetian blinds were raised. I looked around, no one in sight. Quickly, I unslung my binoculars, held them up to my eyes. What was I focused on? That wasn't William's window, that was mine. There was a window. To the left. Should be just about there. There it was. The window. Just as though I were a few yards from it. Having fun, buddy? No. Uh, no, officer, I... Uh, See anything good? Uh, look, officer, I... I yeah, just... yeah, I know. You're trying to spot planes. Yeah, trying to spot planes. Why don't you try spotting them from the roof? Well, I, uh, never spotted anything from the roof. Look, wise guy, I'll give you a tip. I'm easy going. But when headquarters gets on my tail, I gotta play rough. Now, somebody puts in a complaint, and I catch you causing trouble, I'll run you in. You understand? Well, I... Well, so far, there's been no complaint. Now, let's just leave it that way, huh? So just beat it now before I change my mind. Two days after that, the thought of that cop catching me with the binoculars made me tremble. I found my hands shaking when I lit a cigarette. Couldn't eat. I knew that I must find some way to reassure myself about Williams or I'd lose my mind. One morning, after I'd spent a sleepless night listening and watching, the music went on. My plan was to wait till the music stopped. Possibly then, Williams would go out. And as soon as he left, I'd slip out and follow him. I waited while that music ground out, that metallic sentiment squeezed out through a loudspeaker. Nine o'clock. Nine thirty. Ten o'clock. Ten thirty. My head started to go round and round like the record under the needle. 
Eleven o'clock. The music still kept on and on and on. <gasps> Suddenly, I sat up quickly, looked at my watch. Three o'clock. I'd been sleeping, but the record, it was still... Austin. Mr. Kenyon. Mr. Kenyon. Torsten. Torsten, he always talks about blood. Mr. Kenyon, did you say something? Don't you come in here! Don't come in here! Oh, Mr. Kenyon, what's the matter? You keep away, Torsten, you keep away from me! Keep away? All right, all right. Only, I, I was just going to tell you, don't use the incinerator for a while. We're cleaning it out for the next couple of hours. And, uh, incinerator? Yeah. Oh. Well, why tell me? Oh, we tell everybody. We don't keep it no secret. Mr. Williams, too? Well, he pays his rent. Only he's not home. I just knocked, didn't I? Yeah, but you came in here with a key. Why? Because I hear you yell like a bull. I thought maybe something was wrong. Maybe... Maybe something is wrong with Mr. Williams. Why don't you open his door? Look, Mr. Kenyon, I don't go around opening people's doors for, for the fun of it. I got a job to keep. I got a reputation to think of. If you think a super's job is easy, you got it all wrong. I didn't mean it that way. Well, okay. Only, please, don't use the incinerator, huh? Why did William's record stop just before Torsten knocked? Why didn't he answer Torsten's call? He wanted privacy. Privacy to play his record. Every day for the next week, that music played at the strangest hours. It became a personal message to me. I was next. Get ready, Kenyon. You're next to have the floor of your apartment scraped, the walls done over. Many times I thought of calling the police. But what good would that do? No one would believe me just because of a record. No one would believe me without some proof. That was it. Prove something that would stand up in court before a judge, before a jury. Yeah, but before I could get that, he might creep into this room. Slowly, quietly, while I was asleep, while I was in that bed, helpless as a child. Hour after hour, I walked the streets trying to think, to reason my way out. Yesterday, I sat huddled in a chair all day. The music didn't play at all. About seven o'clock, I went out for something to eat. In the evening paper, there was an item that could be the basis for a good short story. When I got back, I started to clip it out. And then I got my nerves again. I locked the door. I went to both the windows. I locked one window. Then I went to the other one. Wait a minute. This window was the window with the fire escape. Whose window was that on the other side of the fire escape? It was his window. William's window. I stared at it as though I were hypnotized. The light was on. That meant he was home. Maybe I could... Maybe I could crawl out on the platform and peek in through the window. Maybe I could get a look at him. As I was thinking these thoughts, the music sounded. And I started to sweat. Cold, icy sweat. I started to close the window, but I... I caught myself, and I pushed it back open. With the palms of my hands wet... I climbed up on the window ledge, and I crawled out on the fire escape, and I made my way along the iron bars as silently as I could, and the window was just in front of me, and I felt my throat go dry as I leaned my head over to try to look in. I swallowed hard and tried to keep my body concealed. The Venetian blinds were drawn all the way, but they were slanted in such a way that permitted me to see inside. I craned my head forward and looked. It was dark inside. But I could make out the living room and the phonograph, large cabinet machine, there was a couch, and there, there was a man, and it seemed as though he was dancing, swaying to the music, and it kept getting louder, and he kept coming towards me, nearer and nearer, he must have seen me, and I couldn't move, and he kept coming nearer, moving in the shadows, nearer, nearer. When I came
came out of it, I was in my own apartment, lying on my own couch. And Inspector Fields was there and a lot of other people. Uh, he'll be okay now. Did you get him? Did you get him? Yeah, they, they got him. They think. They think? Don't they know? It was Williams. I saw him in his room. He was coming at me. He was going to kill me. I was going to be next. He was coming at me there uh, in the take dark. Take it easy, Kenyon. Take it easy. That wasn't Williams. That was me. Oh. Listen, Inspector. There's something I haven't told you. Something I heard. The other two times. Yeah? I thought it would sound crazy, but I heard music. A song. An old song. An old record. Yeah? What was it? It was I'll See in My Dreams. Heard it again tonight in William's room. He was playing it. Yeah, I guess you heard it tonight, all right. And I heard it the other two times, too. The same way. The same song. Maybe you heard it. Maybe you just thought you heard it. How much do you remember? Do you remember coming at me with those scissors? Scissors? Kenyon, we found your other apartment. The one you moved out of a month ago. My other apartment? Mm Mm-hmm. And we found your wife. I... I don't have a wife. No, but you did. And that song you were talking about, it uh, was on the phonograph. And your wife, she was dead. They made me talk to a doctor today. Hallucinations, he said. Hearing that song that way, I sort of remember Alice. She was playing a record, and I was clipping something out of... I I don't know what to believe, because I thought the song was real, and the woman, the dead woman, I thought that was a dream, just a bad dream. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't hang a man for a dream, would they? <laughs> Suspense. Dream Song, starring Henry Morgan, presented by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines, America's largest selling wines. This is Truman Bradley to tell you why Roma Wines are America's favorite wines. It's because Roma selects and presses the choicest California grapes. Then, with centuries-old skill and winemaking resources unmatched in America... Roma guides this grape treasure to tempting perfection. These better-tasting Roma wines are placed with other mellow Roma wines to await later selection for your enjoyment from the world's greatest reserves of fine wines. This weekend, treat your friends to the better taste of a fine Roma California wine, such as ruby red Roma port, golden amber Roma sherry, or flame bright Roma muscatel. Discover for yourself why Roma Wines, that's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines are enjoyed by more Americans than any other wines. Tonight's suspense play was by George Bellack and Ben Kerner. Henry Morgan will soon be seen in his first starring picture, the screenplay Enterprise production, So This Is New York, and may be heard every Wednesday night on another network for Eversharp Schick. Be sure to listen next Thursday, same time, to Suspense. Produced and directed by William Spear for the Roma Wine Company of Fresno, California. This is CBS The Columbia Broadcasting System.